Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our first guest speaker of the day. He is our senior senator for Illinois and the assistant Democratic leader for the U.S. Senate, Senator Dick Durbin. Senator Durbin has served in the U.S. Senate since 1996 and following 14 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. He's well respected by his colleagues. He was elected Democratic Whip and has filled that position since 2002. Prior to that, he served as legal counsel to former Lieutenant Governor Paul Simon and to the Illinois State Senate Judiciary Committee. We recognize Senator Durbin for his leadership on natural resource and energy issues and know him to be a friend of the Great Lakes. By his membership on the Great Lakes Task Force, his unwavering support for funding of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative as an original co-sponsor of the Great Lakes Ecological and Economic Protection Act. He is widely recognized as a steward and advocate for Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes, working to protect our treasured resources from challenges ranging from industrial pollution to invasive species. Other achievements that we may not be aware of are his leadership to protect children from the harm of caused by tobacco and his work to strengthen Illinois transportation infrastructure, a critical factor supporting economic development in Illinois. He has successfully secured funds for major highway, infrastructure, and transit improvements throughout the state. We are honored to have you with us here today, uh, Senator, uh, to help kick off our 60th anniversary meeting. We look forward to your remarks. Please join us in welcoming Senator Dick Durbin. Thanks, Wayne. Appreciate the uh, kind words. I want to welcome special out-of-town guest, Chairman John Allen, Director of the Office of Great Lakes in Michigan, and Christine St-Pierre from the province of Quebec. Uh, I'm glad that this is a multi-state and multinational undertaking as it should be. Um, so we had a visitor last week in Washington, you may have noticed, and it was uh, one of those humbling moments when they tell us ahead of time that Pope Francis is coming and he will be in the building for 100 minutes. And uh, it was the tightest security I have ever seen, uh, far beyond uh, the inauguration of any president. Uh, and I was, I guess, honored to be part of the welcoming committee. And um, that meant that there were about 10 of us who were officially uh, to escort the Pope into the House chamber. Uh, it was in a different manner than I've ever seen. Whenever we had um, heads of state or special guest, uh, we'd usually all walk through a room, shake hands, get a picture, and then escort the person in. That was not the case here. We were given uh, assigned places uh, to stand in the hallway as he walked through uh, with little pieces of tape with our name on them and put our feet on them and don't move and don't extend your hand unless he extends his and so forth. It was, uh, it, it was high security and um, I lost out. I thought I might get a chance to initially say hello to him um, when Senator Lisa Murkowski, Republican of Alaska, uh, really had an ingenious move. Instead of reaching out to shake his hand, she held out two rosaries. <laughs> he stopped and blessed the rosaries and gave me the back as he's walking away. So, <laughs> Lisa, you know. And so I thought I'd completely missed every opportunity, first pope I ever met, to even shake his hand until the very end of it when he was leaving the building to get in this tiny fiat, <laughs> which I thought was the coolest thing of all. And I happened to be the last person standing by the fiat. And he decided to shake everybody's hands on the way out. And I thought, my goodness, I'm going to get my chance here right as he's leaving the building. And thought, so I thought, I've got to have something profound. You know, this is the pope. How many chances are you going to get? And so he came up to me and extended his hand. I extended mine, and I said, I'm glad you came to America. I mean, North America. I completely blew it. You know, here he obviously is from America, and, um, and he left. Uh, but I will just say to you that um, I don't know if he was convincing uh, to my colleagues who are skeptical of some of the environmental issues and global warming, but I hope so. He really challenges, and I think he continues to. He didn't back off. There were questions about whether he would change his agenda he didn't. He was outspoken uh, from the start. Uh, I have a great speech here, which I'm not going to give you, about the Great Lakes, about how important they are. I think you wouldn't be here unless you believe that. Uh, but I will tell you about a few things that are going on now that we need your help on. So I hope you'll consider them. Uh, I want to tell you one, one story. I will refer to the speech so I get this right. Um, I've had a little battle going on, not, my, not exclusively, but I've kind of been the 
loudest mouth in it, uh, against the dirtiest ship on the Great Lakes, the SS Badger. Uh, every year since 1953, this foul beast has dumped 600 tons of coal ash directly into Lake Michigan, a coal-fired ferry between Wisconsin and Michigan. 36,600 tons of coal ash dumped into Lake Michigan as it traverses from Wisconsin to Michigan and back. That is enough coal ash to coat the entire floor of Lake Michigan with a layer of ash two and a half inches thick. This coal ash, of course, contains arsenic, lead, and mercury, all of which uh, we would like to keep out of our drinking water. And when more than 10 million people rely on Lake Michigan for their drinking water, that's a big deal. They tried everything they could think of to keep this ship rolling and dumping, uh, and including declaring it a national landmark so we couldn't be regulated by the federal government, all of these different things. Uh, and we stopped them. And finally, with the new president, Obama, and uh, EPA regional director, who cared, uh, we started putting the pressure on them. So after years of seeking special favors and not receiving them, the Badger was finally told by the EPA, no more. The result this spring was the first sailing season in 62 years that the SS Badger wasn't using Lake Michigan as a dump for uh, its coal ash. That's a big victory for the commission, for millions of people who love and rely on Lake Michigan. An even bigger success is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Five years, this initiative has supported more than 2,500 restoration projects in eight states and two Canadian provinces, including Northerly Island. I don't know if you'll get a chance to see it. If you live here, you might have picked up some of the news, but I was out there last week. This is a controversial spit of land, little island, man-made island, that used to house an airport called Miggs Field. I love that airport because it serves Springfield, Illinois, which is my hometown, so I, I can't tell you how many flights it took out of that. Well, um, for reasons which he'll have to explain in his book, uh, the last Mayor Daley uh, decided to close it down. And he came out in the middle of the night and, as I best I can see it, ran some road graders over the runway and put big, big X's on it and said it's no longer an airport. And people wondered what would happen next. There's a small part of it being used for a venue, primarily for concerts. But there is a 40-acre uh, stretch of it that has now been restored. And it is nothing short of amazing. This uh, northerly island, when you go out to it, you hardly, hardly believe, were it not for the skyline, that you're that close to one of the major cities of the United States of America. It is, um, it is an ecological, a thoughtful investment that'll give people, people some peace of mind uh, if they care to walk it or bike it. Uh, and of course, it's a refuge for um, migratory uh, waterfowl and the like uh, and for spawning of fish. It, it, I want to salute the mayor and for all who participated in it, the Park District and others. And if you're in town and get a chance, accessible to the public, you're welcome to go out there. I think you'll find it the same way. Now let me talk to you about two or three other things that are topical that you ought to be thinking about, I hope. One is, um, we've got a budget issue in Washington. It's one that is serious. And it's a question of sequestration, which means across the board cuts. And the question is whether or not we will provide all of the money needed on the defense side of the budget, but not on the non-defense side. That's really at the heart of this budget debate. On the defense side, and I, I'm on the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense, so I've, I've, I know it, it's a huge piece of the budget, almost 60% of it, $600 billion for defense and intelligence. On the defense side of the budget, the proposal is to move war fighting funds, which we call OCO funds, $38 billion worth, in to supplement the defense appropriation. I'd love to do that. We can use it. Men and women in uniform deserve the very best. But there's no money for the non-defense side, which means when it comes to your concerns, funding Great Lakes Commission, restoration initiatives, and the like, they're likely to be cut and not increased. And they could be cut dramatically, and we're seeing that on the non-defense side. So this battle is building up, and it's caught up in the presidential campaign. Uh, there are candidates on the Republican side for president, Ted Cruz in particular, who said, I'm willing to shut down the government over Planned Parenthood. Well, that's coming up this week. 
And our guess is that he won't be able to do that. And we believe that Speaker Boehner resigned, um, is retiring, I should say, at the end of October, with the promise that he would at least get 11 weeks of temporary funding of our federal budget at old spending levels, continuing resolution. But at the end of 11 weeks, on December 10th or 11th, whatever it happens to be, we're in the soup again. Are we going to have a budget? And the president is trying to sit down and negotiate it. You need to take this to heart because the money that we need for Great Lakes and other things is tied up in this debate. So the budget debate in Washington uh, should be something that you take uh, very seriously. In addition to that, I think we also ought to be looking at some issues. And I'll take them from Chicago, Illinois perspective. You can apply them to your home situation. Two weeks ago, I went to something called the Thornton Reservoir. The Thornton Reservoir is a former limestone quarry on the south end of Cook County, which is enormous. Enormous. It's like our Grand Canyon of Cook County. And it's about 30 stories deep and maybe a mile long. It is huge. And now the, the Metropolitan Water and Reclamation District uh, is using the reservoir, as they have with the deep tunnel system, as a repository for stormwater, and you know why. When we get these monster storms, it overwhelms the sanitary system and flushes it out in the lake, which is the worst outcome. So we are trying to deal with this, and it is the scope of it is just jaw-dropping. When you stand at the bottom of this reservoir, look at this huge intake and outtake um, opening that they've created for treatment and realize it ain't enough, and neither are the tunnels. We're still, when they implement these, still likely to be overwhelmed. And when we're overwhelmed, so are the Great Lakes. There's more that needs to be done. And clearly, it goes way beyond digging holes and finding old quarries. We clearly need water management policies that are more thoughtful in the 21st century. I'm not an expert. I'll bet you there are 20 people in this room who are. But you know what I'm talking about in terms of water management. When it comes to simple plumbing fixtures, and uh, the use of water, an efficient use of water, um, collecting rainwater, green roofs, rainwater barrels, permeable concrete, you name it. All of this has to be built into our plans if we're serious about Lake Michigan and the rest of the Great Lakes. And that part, to me, uh, we need your help with. Now, this isn't easy because we're talking about government's role, and I think government is the only uh, possible entity we can turn to here that would create uh, some sort of uniform approach, uh, and it's already underway in some places, but to make it even uh, broader in its effectiveness. In addition to that is the whole water quality debate. And I need, I want to commend to you a debate that's going on now about the waters of the U.S. This, most of you know, is EPA regulation about the quality of water, and particularly uh, whether water uh, is that stands in pools or uh, is caught in ditches, is ultimately going to go into some drinking water source. This is a red-hot issue. When the farmers of Illinois come to see me, it, the first thing, they, they're always gracious, even if they don't vote for me, they're gracious, and they say, uh, thank you for everything, thank you, thank you. Now let me tell you the latest thing that's wrong with the EPA. Well, water's the United States. That's number one. They are focused on this. They've got it. They're doing everything they can to reverse this, and there will be votes on the floor of Congress. I happen to think, and I tell them, uh, that there's a lot we can do without making farming prohibitively expensive. And we need your help uh, in your states to, to deliver that message. Just to give you a perspective on this, if I can, in the last, I think, 25 years, we have seen a 250-fold increase in the use of certain herbicides particularly Roundup and 2,4-D, and across the world, a tenfold increase in the use of these herbicides. This gets down to another related hot-button issue on GMO. You know, when Prince Charles decides it's Frankenfoods and all the rest of that, we get into a red-hot debate. I think there's a legitimate scientific debate and difference as to whether GMO foods, which you had this morning if you ate anything, uh, are harmful to us when we consume them. But there can be little debate about the fact that as we move towards some of these herbicides and heavier application of them, 
it raises a water quality issue in the water that we drink and the water that ends up in the Great Lakes and in our rivers. So this to me is a conversation which you need to be part of if we're serious about the Great Lakes. We need to be serious about water quality and we need to make sure we have standards that are thoughtful, reasonable, and enforced. And that'll take a bipartisan effort for that to happen. And seriously, at this moment, it's not where it should be. On invasive species, I was on the Appropriations Committee. We used to do earmarks. I probably earmarked more money for that miserable Asian carp than anything else I've ever done in Congress. Trying to stop that miserable fish from getting up the Illinois River uh, into Lake Michigan. We think we have so far. But who knows? And we clearly have more to do in terms of stopping these invasive species, who I think would be absolutely devastating uh, to the lakes, and we will continue to do it. The last part came up to me recently from some local people relates to pipelines. There is a pipeline near Mackinac that goes in, uh, it isn't Lake Michigan there, it's Lake Straits of Mackinac, and it goes underwater. And Enbridge owns it. Enbridge was a company that owned if some people from Ohio. They had a, a break in one of their pipelines um, within the last year or two that was pretty awful. So I'm trying to encourage these pipeline companies, particularly Enbridge, to be more thoughtful in their inspection of these pipelines and to have the necessary shutoff valves to protect, God forbid, uh, in some emergency circumstance. So let me close by telling you that um, I appreciate you being here, and I want to help you, and I want to work with you. You've got to be engaged in this political debate, and I think you know that, uh, at the state level as well as at the federal level. Some critical decisions which we're making now are going to make a big difference as to what those Great Lakes look like for a long time to come. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Chicago.